you are having your first singularity experience over the last four days? This is about my 11th. I've spent lots of time at singularity over the last three years. What I discover is that when you go to singularity for the first time, you come away with a permanent sense that every way you're thinking about life is just a little bit less than it needs to be. Have you got that experience just about now on your fourth day? In innovation terms, what this means is that we mostly are now seeing that the world is creating a steady stream of variants of known things when what we really need is radical transformation of new things. We need to change categories, we need to change industries. The great speakers that have been on the stage over the last four years should have given you a deep sense of the unsustainability of healthcare, of the Cambrian explosion of devices that we're getting in healthcare, of the radical new business models, experience models, and capabilities that are driving the frontiers of healthcare. And collectively, our job now is to try to figure out what it means to think about this in a really deep way and act on it in a practical way. So as Daniel just indicated, I've been thinking about innovation as a topic and as a scientist for 34 years. And what I'm here to tell you is relatively simple. For the first time in history, more or less at just the moment we need it, innovation is giving up its secrets. By and large, throughout history, people have treated it as an exercise in creativity. And it is decidedly not that. That is never the scarce resource in innovation effectiveness. It's discipline. And learning how to think it through is a very big deal. The heart of it all, of course, is change. And this is what Singularity University does better than anybody. They get you sort of sheep dipped in the world of exponential change. And you will remember it forever. And to most of us, I remember the first time I came to Singularity three years ago, what I came away with was a sort of deep sense that I really wasn't paying enough attention with peripheral vision to things that were coming in at very fast speeds from places I was not attending to. That's a really healthy thing to do. And the reason for that is because the change that most of us notice is change to things we already recognize. So when I was a kid back in the Pleistocene era, I had a whole bunch of these things, right? Some of you might remember this technology. I was mortified recently when one of my three adult daughters presented me with one and said, Dad, have you ever heard these before? They have a really warm sound, you know? Yeah, I know. Now, I'm a kind of a digital guy, so when music changed to this format, I repurchased enthusiastically all of my music, and I said, now I'm done. Those of you that are laughing are laughing because you know what happened to me when the file format changed to MP3. I'm completely convinced there's an evil cabal at Apple right now plotting to make a new file format that I just can't live without, MP4, MP5, MP6, MP, I don't know, lightning bolt, something. And I think their plan, their secret plan, is to make sure that they soak that Larry Keeley idiot one more time so that he buys all 33,000 songs in his iPod all over again. But you know where we are, right? You know what's happened. The business model itself changed, and now we can pay a reasonable price every month for streaming the stuff that we love and even sort of get surprised by stuff we didn't know we love that's consistent with the stuff that we love. This is what we're seeing everywhere. Not just a change in the sort of technical nature of an offer, but a change in the experience, the business model, and the elegant capabilities all stitched together. This is what victory looks like. This is how you're going to take the extraordinary numbers of good ideas that you've been sort of injected, inspected, infected, neglected, and detected with over the last few days, and learn how to build them into something that becomes comprehensive and game-changing. Now, I'm going to stay away from medical examples for just a couple of minutes, and then I promise I'll come back around and show you what's likely to occur with the kinds of revolutionary ideas that you've heard in the last four days, okay? I thought I would talk about Alibaba because it's a particularly interesting moment to do so. This is the week that they have sort of celebrated a holiday that they invented six years ago. Six years ago, they created Singles Day. And they specifically did it because the middle of November in China is a very weak time for normal retail sales. So they created what in China is culturally a little bit like Valentine's Day. If you're, if you're attracted to somebody, 
On Singles Day, you're supposed to give them a little gift, a little something or other, to indicate that you like them, okay? And Singles Day is on November 11th. One, 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 lots of singles, get it? Okay, I know. So what they did is they sort of romanced this. And on Singles Day, the idea is that you're supposed to give this gift and last year, the fifth year that they were running Singles Day, they really got it to an extreme level of performance, okay? Now, Alibaba, if you're not familiar with it, is what you would get in America if you cross-fertilized Amazon, plus eBay, plus Etsy, plus PayPal, plus, you know, a delivery service. It's a lot like FedEx, but often uses bicycles and a whole bunch of other things, including like Craigslist. And the idea of that mashup as you heard from an earlier speaker just about an hour ago, like Uber in the sense that it doesn't really use anything new, it just elegantly integrates many known things, so it makes it easy for you to give these gifts. And last year, for instance, on Singles Day 2015, I'm not making this up, 70,000 people were given room vacuum cleaners. In America, on Valentine's Day, you give somebody a room vacuum cleaner for Valentine's Day, you expect to be whacked with it later that same day. But collectively, what they sold on November 11, 2015, was $6 billion worth of goods and services. The way they did that last year, by the way, largest in history, 10 times larger than what we do in the entire United States on Cyber Monday, okay? What they did to achieve that was they created this sort of social phenomenon. They said, you know, if you really are sweet on your hot honey, what you should do is not only give them a gift on Singles Day, but it should be time-stamped at 11, 11 a.m. I mean, what could possibly be more romantic, okay? And many people panicked when they missed the early morning order window to get that timestamp at 11, 11. And they said, no, no, it's not a, all is not lost. We can also timestamp it 11, 11 p.m. <laughs> I know. Six billion dollars in one day. That's why that guy's smiling, okay? And that's what contributed to the fact that they had the most successful IPO in history. But wait, yesterday was Singles Day. Did you catch what they did yesterday? 14.3 billion. I know. This is weird, ladies and gentlemen, and yet this is what we have to create to radically reinvent healthcare in the United States and in the entire Western medical you know, system of care. This is the way it will ultimately learn to be stitched together and to be elegant, and I want to talk to you about exactly how that happens. To do that, I have to blow up an awful lot of the normal myths about innovation. What people believe about innovation is based on nonsense. It's based on myth, not method. We have to root out the lore and substitute logic. It's extremely important to get a deeper sense of what we can do. Those of you taking photos of the slides, by the way, you're welcome to do it. I really like that. But I've also posted them for you on a secure website, and I will reveal that unto you at the tail end of the festivities. So maybe you could just stay in the conversation, OK? What I'm going to do is distill this into two simple things. I'm going to tell you that there's a revolution in how to innovate effectively. This is what I'm going to sort of describe as how to innovate in the right ways. And then I'll follow that up with some speculations from my crystal ball, which I polished up especially for this gig, about what I think are going to be the most valuable innovations. And I've been focused on healthcare and other fields, but a lot in healthcare for 34 years. I've seen lots of changes, and I've never seen anything like either the degree or the pace or the magnitude of shifts that have happened in the last three years. So it's extremely important to have this conversation here at XMed and to make it as pragmatic as possible so you know what to do. As it happens, I wrote a book about this, and I mean, who cares, okay? Um, what I'm sort of confessing with this particular slide is how stupid this was on my part. Why so stupid? Uh, this is because I have had in my uh, firm for 29 years really great anthropologists, right? And I'm several years into the writing of this book. I walked by one of them in the hallway. She says, how's that book thing coming? And I said, oh, you know, it's a slog. And she said, you know, people don't read books anymore, don't you? So I'm illustrating how freaking stupid I am to have spent this much money trying to get the content right. Because she was right. 
people don't read books. I have several colleagues that have not yet read this book. It has a particularly big ambition that it's trying to distill what's known now about getting innovation to work as a science. But let me tell you, so that you don't have to buy or pretend to read or decorate a coffee table with the book, let me distill it now into the really small number of principles that you need to master in 10 minutes, okay? At the heart of this book was a really cool methodology. We took 1,200 innovations over a 200-year time frame. And we asked the question, do they have anything in common? We did this piece of research 19 years ago. Our hypothesis was a null set. We were comparing so many different things over such a long time frame that we assumed we would get very little real structure amongst the things that were game-changing, category-changing, globally shifting innovations. And we were as surprised as anybody else when we discovered that there are now, and wait for it, have always been 10 distinct types of innovation. That's what we did with a piece of cluster analytics, and these are those 10 types of innovation. The colors on this model are neither decorative nor random, and they really matter a lot. The colors in blue, four types of innovation that sort of really are the ways in which your firm sort of is structured, how its business model works, how it partners with others, how you get your unfair share of talent, and what signature processes you have. These are things that are frequently taught in business schools and places like that. In the middle, it's sort of gold color. That's what you've been hearing about in the orgy of new devices coming thick and fast over the last few days. That's the new capabilities that are beginning to emerge in really profound ways in our own sort of healthcare Cambrian explosion. In general, for almost all industries, people over-index on the stuff in the middle. It's really important stuff. It's generally built in part by engineers. You can't usually innovate without some of it but it is usually overemphasized to the exclusion of all the other types of innovation and the stuff. And the orange color on the right is mostly advanced in social science schools, in design schools, and in marketing programs. It's how you communicate with human beings and get them to love the thing that you're producing. And here's why this matters. All the things that I'm describing, they come from talent pools that these days have their own exponential amount of stuff that they have to master. And think about the meetings you've been in. How often do you find the business guys and the engineers and the designers and marketers all happening in a wonderful, warm, friendly, productive relationship with one another? Dysfunctionality is the name of the game, right? So this is why breakthrough innovation is so hard. And when you learn to use the right tradecraft to break it down, to make sure that you respectfully embed the work of great business theorists, great engineers, and great designers and marketers, then you get your badass breakthroughs in a really interesting way. And put very simply, the reason for you to pay attention to this model is because the rule of thumb, if you want to create a breakthrough, is that you have to use five or more types of innovation and all three colors have to be represented. Hit that magic sort of threshold and you've got something with the power to change the world and that gives you three things. Bolder ideas that are way easier for you to implement because you're more conscious about what you're actually trying to achieve and they're harder for others to copy. Okay, bolder ideas, easier to implement, harder to copy. That's the reason to understand this important discovery. We made this discovery 19 years ago, but we have redone the analysis every other year since to try to figure out what's new and what's changing. When you download the slides, you're welcome to have these tight, concise definitions and these examples you're already familiar with that epitomize individual types of innovation. But please remember, the critical thing here is to have five or more types of innovation orchestrated with care into an elegant whole and all three colors have to be represented. Then you've got, at least at a prima facie level, the genetic code of a breakthrough that can change the world. Now, what we've studied beyond that sort of basic discovery is what do you really need to do to win at innovation? At Doblin, my little firm, now part of Deloitte, we have about 70 what I think of as Navy SEALs of innovation. You don't get hired at Doblin unless you have an advanced degree, usually a master's degree or a PhD in innovation. Ten of us teach in the only design school in the world that gives out such PhDs and started doing so 23 years ago, okay? In Doblin, 
you just have to be familiar with about 60 or 70 pieces of trade craft. But what I've done for you to simplify everything is to sneeze onto the screen here the 10 that matter most. Okay? And they might apply in some cases to an individual initiative, a project. They might apply in some cases to a platform where you're trying to make sure that you do something technologically elegant that the rest of the world can build upon. Or they might apply to your enterprise or to your ecosystem. Generally, this is a fun fact to know and tell, more than 90% of the time when teams begin to innovate, they have defined the problem in the wrong way. This is a classic problem of framing. So we have extraordinary tools to make sure that before people begin, they're designing the problem itself in a productive way. After that, it turns out you really must teach innovation to your colleagues in a way that is consistent, systemic, and measurable. There are many competing systems to do this, so this is not a sales pitch. I'm not trying to get you to buy or read or use my book or anybody else's. What I will tell you is that the normal way people do it is they read a couple of articles on innovation from different authors. They borrow something here and something there. They use a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I have Newton, Toe Frog, and they wonder why they get shitty outcomes, okay? Because the normal outcome for innovation is fewer than 5% of innovation initiatives return the cost of capital of the sponsoring enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where medicine was when leeches were the really sophisticated treatment, okay? So we really need to figure out how to do it differently. If you want to use the stuff from IDEO, that's fantastic. I got 32 students there and seven former colleagues there. Those are friends of mine. Their stuff is good. Just use something consistent and something systematic, okay? If you're very clever, you will begin with a diagnostic of your innovation condition. More about that in a moment. What you really should do, though, is make sure that you stop the brainstorming. Brainstorming is, in my opinion, a carcinogen the Surgeon General will get around to regulating eventually. Okay? This is the opposite of brainstorming. It's how you generate one idea after a half a day or a day-long exercise instead of 338 ideas that you won't do anything with other than to vote with freaking sticky dots. Okay? What we've learned about innovation in 34 years of studying it is that it's harder than that, and it deserves a little more respect, okay? So I'll show you that in a moment. You need to manage those individual innovation initiatives in your enterprise across a portfolio so that you know which ones are for the core customers you're serving now, which ones are for adjacent customers, but using your current capabilities, and which ones are going to be changing both your capabilities and your customer set, because all of those have really big implications for how you behave. These days, one of the most exciting things that you learn a lot about from Singularity is how to use crowds, clouds, partners, and prizes to radically reduce the cost and the complexity and the risk of innovating. As I like to say, innovation today is radically different than it was in the old days four years ago. Okay? <laughs> My colleague John Hagel at Deloitte has done a very brilliant job of studying where you should put innovation in the enterprise so that you don't get the antibodies immediately destroying it. At Doblin, we create an awful lot of war rooms or immersion environments so people can be sort of sheep dipped in the thematics that are going to be increasingly important over the next decade that your innovations should be born of. Think of it as the sort of nutrient bath in which your colleagues should be, you know, immersed when they're trying to innovate. And the most important thing for changing your outcomes is to staple metrics, incentives, and rewards to a great innovation capability. If you do not do so, you will always get about, at most, a 20% hit rate, okay? What we've discovered is that when you use this trade craft, you can at least get a 7x lift in global norms for innovation return on investment and innovation success rates. And what we commonly get is up to a 20x lift in global norms. So that means going from a hit rate of less than 5%, that's the global norm, to somewhere between 35%, that's the worst we've done in 14 years, up to about 82 or 84%, which for the moment is what we think is the outside range of what people can achieve with the known frontiers of innovation effectiveness. Anyway, this is the first topic I wanted to make sure I shared with you. Nine years ago, Doblin created a signature algorithm for determining how companies were doing with innovation. It had two components, innovation performance and innovation capabilities. And it was, frankly, difficult for us to do and to administer because it's an awful lot like an audit. 
When we were purchased by Deloitte three years ago, we mentioned this, we had it sitting in a drawer. They said, why didn't you do anything with this? And we said, ah, it's like weird and complicated. And they said, what's it like? We said, it's kind of like an audit. And they said, well, we have some people that do that sort of thing. And we said, really? So it turns out that they're good at it. And, uh, and now this is, in various forms, the industry's leading diagnostic. You don't know where you stand with innovation? Well, for goodness sakes, start with an audit, get your baseline, because you really won't be able to improve it dramatically if you don't know how to do so. That takes just a few weeks, and, and it's a really big help in figuring out how to intervene. This, as I like to say, is what cures brainstorming, okay? What you're seeing here is a student platform tool set that I give away to my graduate students in design schools and business schools and in engineering schools. And what it does is it allows a team to work for about a day to answer 14 questions in this order. This is what we call high protocol innovation. It's the same thing that keeps patients alive when they show up in an emergency room with blood spurting out of an artery. Even a sleepy student can tend to keep them alive because they're using high protocols. Protocols matter. It's what keeps your airplane in the sky when the commercial pilot is also tired, or has been working a long shift, or there's windy conditions, and it's what will almost always give you a radically better answer and a much smaller number of bigger ideas when it comes time to pursue innovation. These 14 questions in order give you a great start. These 116 innovation tactics are the Lego building bricks that you use to make something that is a true breakthrough. My colleague Ryan Pickell, co-author of my book, is the guy that did this little piece of research. Turns out in the 4,000 innovations in this little computer right here past the, the, the wing, 4,000 of the most valuable innovations in the world, all they need to be built is some combination of these 116 tactics. This does for innovation what object-oriented programming did for software 44 years ago, okay? It's a really big breakthrough. And this is what you do to use clouds, crowds, partners, and prizes. You've been hearing a lot about Kaggle and Gidguac and Innocentive and Topcoder and XPRIZE and Amazon Web Services. This is what you do to make sure that you get your innovation to be tested for a fraction of the cost that it used to take just four years ago. As I like to say, if you're creating a new business, Four years ago, it was nine months and seven to nine million dollars before you could accept your first dollar of revenues. Today, you can do that in a matter of weeks, and you can have your entire business be rebuilt end to end more than seven times before you're spending as much as you have to spend to get your first dollar of revenues. And this last piece of those protocols is how you design your business model. When I teach business model theory, what I like to say is business models are weird little suckers. No successful business model has ever been the same in stage one as it is in stage two or stage three. Learning to plan that ahead of time is like playing chess instead of checkers. And people just generally don't know they should do it. Now, would you like to know the really good news? You can get all this stuff, which normally we would have charged millions of dollars for, for free because Deloitte agreed to give it away for free in this new app, 10 Types of Innovation app on the iTunes store. There is a charge inside the app that's completely optional. It's for a news feed. If you pay a one-time fee of 20 bucks, you can see how if there was a breakthrough innovation announced somewhere in the world this morning, Doblin Innovation Analyst will analyze it by this afternoon and show you the types of innovation that it's using and the tactics that it appears to be using as best we're able to assess. Okay? So that's the way in which all of that tradecraft, millions of dollars worth of research and development, has been given away to the world for free thanks to Deloitte's attempt to try to do things in a bold new way to help people innovate effectively. But here's the deal. You've been sitting in this comfortable room for four days, most of you getting the absolute wit scared out of you, I'm betting, right? Is that the way it feels for some of you? So what do we do to frame that up? How do you take the energy that Daniel Kraft and all of his buddies have been sort of suffusing you with, and instead of being terrified by it, jujitsu it into something that's productive and clear and compelling? That's making the right sort of choices and the right kind of options to focus on it. Now, I want to give you a sense of how that works in general terms first. As I said earlier, what tends to happen in any industry is people over-index on the technology itself. 
This is what people tend to believe innovation is all about, right? Remember the old cliche? If you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Oh, by the way, never been true. Do a Google search for mouse traps or things you can do to mice. I mean, you can electrocute the little suckers, you can glue their feet to the floor, you can snap their neck, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Nobody's ever done any better than the 50 cent, you know, trap from Victor Mousetrap that hasn't changed in 45 years, okay? So what we do is we over-index on the stuff in the middle. Clever innovators learn to balance that out with business model innovation and experience innovation. You're thinking, I don't have the money to do that, those of you that are running startups, wrong. It's actually cheaper. You spend less when you learn to balance your overall innovation and you get a much bigger return. And I can illustrate this in general terms with Amazon Prime. How many of you are Prime members, just so I can calibrate? Look at that, look around, keep your hands up for a moment. I'm estimating that's at least 80% of the audience. I want to remind you how you became an Amazon Prime member. An innocuous little email came to you about seven years ago. And it said something to the effect of, you know, of all of our customers, we've checked it, and, and, and you're one of our favorites. So we have got a heck of a deal for you. You sign up today for $79, and then you're going to get free shipping on millions of items. Now, Ignore the cognitive dissonance there, right? You've got to pay 79 bucks, but then the shipping is free, okay? And the email also said, but wait, there's more in the way these kinds of emails go. It said you can have instant, unlimited streaming of 41,000 movies and TV episodes. They got huge data at Amazon. They know exactly what 41,000 movies and TV episodes nobody ever, ever watched, and you can watch all those you want for free. And there was one more little spiff. They said there's 350,000 things you can borrow and read on your Kindle. Don't even try to read it on your iPad, sucker. <laughs> got to have a Kindle. But you can then read all these things that we've got laying around that nobody ever reads. And what happened is millions of us signed up, and they moved from two types of innovation to six types of innovation, and the analysts went ape shit. You know, the, the sort of complaint about Amazon by overeducated analysts always is that they live on very thin margins. So I want to show you how the analysts freaked out, okay? What they said is, geez, we think the average person is going to pay 79 bucks but get $90 worth of services. Auga, auga, dive, dive, they're going to lose money on every customer. But think about your own behaviors. After you joined Amazon Prime, did you find yourself ordering more stuff? Yes. Did you order weirder shit? <laughs> right. This is what happens. Members end up spending one and a half times as much uh, in terms of purchases. That's one and a half times as many purchases and spend 2.4 times as much per year. The average person, after they join, spend 1224 in a year as opposed to formerly 505. And that is precisely what caused these guys to say, whoa, this is really great, just the incremental profits from the stuff that you would not have otherwise bought from Amazon made them 78 additional dollars in profit from you after you became a Prime member. And last year, they raised the price to $99. How many of you, come on, show of hands, said, that's it, I'm dropping out of this program, I've had it with these people, 20 more bucks, one guy, okay, one guy. And the rest of you, what did you do? You said, I'm going to have to buy more shit. <laughs> On any given day, ladies and gentlemen, 90% of what Amazon ships goes to those of us in the room that are Prime members. This is a radical business model, a psychological business model, a business model that causes us to be loyal to the firm, except for this very smart gentleman who feel, figured out he was getting hosed, okay? So it's a very interesting way to think about the way in which industries change, and it's what people don't do often enough when they create breakthrough businesses. Now, what's, I think, very popular in rooms like this, at times like this, is brilliant devices and brilliant new kinds of capabilities. And I'm betting that Elizabeth Holmes is a hero to many of you, as she is to me. You know, I made all three of my daughters read her fantastic profile in The New Yorker, Blood Simpler by Ken Aletta. This woman is a complete inspiration to me and to every thinking person that I know. And look, she's using nine types of innovation 
And this is kind of the device-led, business model-led, experience-led kind of thing that most people think is the way it ought to work. This is the sort of genetic code of a unicorn, as they like to say in Wall Street investing terms, okay? Now, she's had a little setback this week with Safe, Safeway, right? $330 million hiccup because she didn't hit her performance targets frequently or, or in time. But I think the thing that's interesting about this is we tend to be so blinded by this form of innovation that we don't even see that there are other choices, choices that are less risky, more likely to succeed, and frankly, more elegant. I'm going to take you through some examples. Walgreens has been radically altering the experience that they're delivering in their stores and specifically moving much of the magic into their app, Seven Types of Innovation. They are now both supporting hospital delivery systems and radically competing with them. It's a much better place to go get your flu shot, typically, and things like that. You've heard a lot about Watson in the last few days. If you happen to have $2.3 billion laying around and you want to invest in something really cool, you could do a lot worse than cognitive computing and the ways in which this is, is working. Uh, one of my adult daughters was number one in her medical school class a few years ago. I have not yet had the heart to tell her about Watson. If you meet her, please don't tell her. Watson reads 3,800 different, you know, sort of publications a day and masters more stuff in a year than the doctor that gave birth to you mastered in a lifetime, okay? So this is a great thing to do if you have $2.3 billion that you're willing to spend. We at Deloitte did a great analysis of Watson, which you can have for free, and you can see how it's being used for surprising things now, like inferring ideal care flow models in hospital systems and in clinics in really interesting ways. Rock Health is a pretty exciting accelerator, and it's got a lot of startups. These are some of their startups and their portfolio that they've invested in. Five types of innovation, but I want to be clear about this. No accelerator anywhere in the world, no incubator anywhere in the world has ever done any better than a 4x lift in innovation ROI compared to companies doing it on their own. Now, 4x is not nothing. But remember that what we think is the baseline norm for innovation effectiveness is 7x, and what we think is the outside range you can hit is 20x. So there's still some room to grow. I love Rock Health. We at Deloitte are partners at Rock Health. Many of the firms that I work with and serve, like Mayo Clinic and Kaiser Permanente, are also working with them. So I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you that when you see innovation predominantly as an exercise in finding technologies and talent and sticking those things together, you get this far, not this far, in how you transform innovation. What you can see out the other side of something like Rock Health is what Podometrics is doing. Turns out that people that have diabetes and extreme cases of diabetes really dislike it when their feet get cut off later. And so, giving them the kinds of tools and behavioral shifts that allow them to know how to avoid that very scary outcome turns out to be elegant and important. MIT, Stanford, and Harvard, so they got lots of eggheads that are involved in this. And there's lots of things that are being done to try to make this a winning platform. But as you can see here, there are five types of innovation. That is just that threshold, and all three colors are represented. So I like this one. I'm not showing you any innovations I don't like. I'm just telling you that there are typical errors of omission that people can address. We've all got our devices. I'm wearing two every day. They document just exactly how deadly my consulting lifestyle is, OK? Um, and that's a plus, I guess. But what I'm really excited about is the way Apple is learning to open up its technology to smart authors. So both HealthKit and specifically ResearchKit are new capabilities that are designed to make this device go an awful lot deeper in the next few years than it does now. That's five types of innovation. Again, above threshold, so we believe this will be important. But it will get much more important when the talented individuals in this room figure out how to harness it into something that becomes a bit more like an ecosystem. Rally, now part of, or has sort of taken the spotlight technology, and this is, by the way, what mostly happens with tech startups, is they get sort of subsumed into somebody else's business model and service model. And so Rally Health has bought Spotlight, and they're trying to do this to help sponsor individuals that are going through life stage shifts 
to be able to do what they're trying to do in a connected, social media-driven ecosystem, five types of innovation. Again, give us the sort of sense that this will be important. We kind of wish that they had done a few more in the blue area, because that would make it much stronger. But let me tell you where I'm going with this. All the great innovations, the ones that are going to radically alter the practice of medicine, the economics of medicine, and the experience of medicine, are going to behave as ecosystems, not just individual technologies, and certainly not just technology platforms. Go to any cancer center in the world. MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, all the best ones. They're orchestrating the activities of thousands of research professionals tens of thousands of different firms, and they're orchestrating it around things that are increasingly custom-tailored to individuals and their circumstances. So that's what you're seeing in the way in which already complex, costly conditions are being tackled. But too often, people do that sort of catch-as-catch-can without conscious, systematic use of the trade craft that actually makes it easier to do. So, when you start to see the world this way, and this is something that's incredibly important to us at Deloitte, you begin to see that ecosystems today are everywhere. Indeed, I believe when the 21st century history of business is written, what it's going to ultimately say is that's the threshold. After we got through connecting a lot of the world digitally, when companies gave way to ecosystems that were organized to create things that really matter to people. Now, the free paper that Deloitte has written that you can get um, to read about this is called Business Ecosystems Come of Age. We had a bunch of us work on it for nine months, um, and it's pretty thoughtful, and it's uh, one of the best sort of such things you can get at this time, especially for the price. Free is a good price. But I thought I'd try to connect that together for you in this way. I believe this is one of the most important things I'm sharing with you as a speculation today. What you see in the world of innovation and healthcare is sort of numerically orchestrated this way. An explosion of devices, a smaller number of things that focus on behavioral change, yet smaller number of things that are trying to do deep analytics and software integration, and a very small number of very smart things that focus on integrated, costly conditions, okay? But too often, these things are separated into these layers. Why? Because that's how you hire talent, and that's how you direct the talent. What will be happening, ladies and gentlemen, inevitably, in this and every other field, is those will become connected into ecosystems. If you're busy working on a device, and you feel like I've just peed in your cornflakes, let me tell you that it is not me being mean. I'm very hopeful that you'll have a very successful experience with your device. You will sell it for a closet full of cash to somebody that will stitch it into an ecosystem. If you're thinking that way now, you're going to find that easier to do. And there will be a shakeout. So netting it out for you, ladies and gentlemen, here's my little, you know, sort of crystal ball for you. We are in the midst of a very exciting Cambrian explosion. That is what Daniel Kraft and everybody on stage has helped you to see over the last four days. A beautiful, amazing, inspiring, sometimes shocking variety of new things that we're able to do all of a sudden because we're clever enough to think about those new capabilities. This is already leading to platform and app level warfare that I think disguises the deeper, richer, more valuable pattern, which is the second thing, okay? The winners amongst that sort of warfare will be the people that do elegant integration. Think about a coral reef for a moment. What I love about coral reefs is the fish don't have to have staff meetings on Monday mornings, right? They don't have to say, hey, let's clean up this part of the reef over here, and hey, people, I mean, can we come together? The sharks are showing up all the time. It's like a constant shark lunch bar. Can we just get a little cleverer about how we're going to defend us? None of that happens inside of a coral reef. A good coral reef is self-organizing, self-optimizing, and it's a system with no center. The elegant integrators of complicated things will be the ones that think that through. How are you going to pull the pieces together? How are you going to have, frankly, a richer ambition about what your innovation will address? And when you're very, very clever about that, and you partner with like-minded you know, weirdos, what you will discover is that you can create the ecosystems that will matter the most about complicated conditions, 
around the most costly things that address what people are trying to do or what they're scared of, and specifically, we'll stitch together not just healthcare per se, but the rest of their life, a theme you've heard from lots of different speakers over the last four days. So ladies and gentlemen, that's my little gift to you, a way to look at innovation, pattern recognition, lots and lots of science behind these assertions, and the good news behind all of that is, of course, that you can be at the vanguard of this new world. If you want the notes, you want the slides, please help yourself. Clientweb.doblin.com is the secure website. It's going to ask you for an event code. That'll be XMED, and that will get you all of today's slides. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate being in a room of people that I believe will change one of the most important parts of this or any other economy in the world. We don't figure out how to do this in a radically better way. We change the standard of living of everybody in the West, their expectations and what we can afford and how they're going to survive or thrive or have a very difficult, short, and brutish life. It's a very important topic. I love being in a room filled with talent that are trying to take it seriously. 57 years ago, George Bernard Shaw wrote something that's always been inspiring to me as a guy in the design and business innovation field. He said, you know, God may have made this world, but that's really no excuse for us not to make it better. And that's our job, ladies and gentlemen, when you do it right, it's the hardest work you'll ever truly love, and it'll change people's lives, your lives, your colleagues' lives, and of course, the lives of the people you're in business to serve. Thank you very much for the chance to be here.